We're going to get into the Word this morning, and uh, if uh, once again, if you missed the last couple Sundays, we are on a new series called Building Big, Building, Building Big, Building Big, and we are talking about, once again, don't Americanize this, do not uh, materialize this, we're talking about building big people. It's actually a mission here at our church, it's actually the purpose of why we gather is to build big people, and I hope you actually have people in your life that you can look up to and be like, man, what a big person. I mean, I hope you have like a grandpa or an uncle or a mom or a neighbor or or maybe a sibling or somebody that you can look at and be like, man, what a big person. I would love to become like them when I'm 80 or 70 or 50 or whatever. Or, you know, if you're 20, looking at 30 or whatever it is, like you can look at people like, what a, what a big person. They were actually our, our goal and God's goal in our life is that we might become big people. And uh, once again, don't materialize that in a way like all big cars and wallets and big boats. And if you have one, take me on it. But um, it's actually not the goal. It's actually to become a big person that you're becoming big from the inside out, a big heart, a big spirit, a big life, a big hand. And so um, big generosity, all kind of stuff. So we're talking about what does it mean to become big? What does it mean to be a big person? How do we become big people? So last week we talked about building big vision, having vision for our life. And my prayer as we dive into our vision here at Rose is we get ready to take an offering here on November 13th, which once again, I pray you write that date on your calendar, have it on a sticky note on a mirror somewhere, be praying about it. We're taking an offering, churchwide offering on, the, on November 13th. And that's not a staff thing. That's not the spiritual people thing. That is every single one of us in the entire church are coming together uh, to give of our resources above and beyond our tithes and offerings to, to help us get ready for our future. When we talk about further discipleship and essentials class and more kids' rooms and more you know, stuff here in the building. And you know, there's a lot of stuff we need to do uh, to continue to serve and help people here at Rose. And so we're gonna need extra resource to do so. And um, why? Because we're, 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 we're moving into becoming big people. So last week we talked about big vision. And I pray that as we talk about Rose's vision, you don't just get captured by that vision, that you actually begin to ask God, what is my vision? I hope that like, as we talk about our corporate vision, it actually inspires your individual vision. Like, man, if God is speaking to Rose, like I want him to speak to me. If God is speaking to them and God is moving them and God is orchestrating stuff for them, I mean, I pray that it, he speaks to me and moves me and builds me and why am I here and what is my vision? What is my purpose? So I pray that you have a dual vision right now, that you not only uh, grab a hold of our corporate vision, but actually something individually is happening to you and your heart and your marriage and your life. And so uh, we're gonna continue in our series today uh, called Building Big People. And we're gonna talk about uh, some things that I believe that big people are and how they act and how they think. And we're gonna read today out of Book of Matthew. Book of Matthew, if you have your Bible, you can grab it. It's gonna be on the screen for you right there. You can follow along, obviously. If you don't have a Bible, there's one right in front of you. You can take that one, it's yours. Um, but uh, if you have your Bible, you version, phone, whatever it is, go ahead and go to Matthew chapter eight. Matthew chapter eight. Well, guys, I don't know if you looked at the, um, the weather here. It starts raining on Friday. We're cheering for it, huh? Matthew eight. Pretty wild story. There's some stories in the Bible that like you read them, especially about Jesus and some of his responses. Um, and you're like, Jesus, what? Like, no, like, this isn't my Jesus. This isn't like the Birkenstock robe, sweet, kind, like Portland Jesus. This is like, you know, like a little harsh Jesus. So sometimes there's like these responses in the, in the gospels that you're like, whoa, Jesus, are, are you good? Uh, and this is one of them, but let me, let me help you uh, understand what it means. But this is a pretty, a pretty funny story to me. Um, and two, a bit, a bit hard to understand what Jesus is saying, but Matthew 8, verse 18. It says, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he instructed his disciples to cross to the other side of the lake. Then one of the teachers or one of the scribes or Pharisees, a teacher of the religious law said to him, teacher, I will follow you anywhere you go, wherever you go, I will follow you. And we'll get Jesus' response. Jesus replied and said, foxes have dens to live in. And birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to leave him to lay his head. Jesus, I want to follow you. Foxes have dens. Like, what are you, like Dr. Seuss? Like, I don't understand the like, I want to follow you. Foxes have dens. Birds have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Then another disciple, disciple, not random person, another one of his disciples said, Lord, first let me return home 
and bury my father. Pretty menial request and question. I just want to go bury my father. But Jesus responded back and said, follow me now. Follow me now. Let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. What? The man comes to Jesus and says, uh, I, want, I want to follow you, Lord. And Jesus says, follow me right now. And he says, I just want to go bury my dad. He goes, no, what the, what the dead bury themselves. What a harsh response, um, unless you understand what's going on. So I want to dive into this story today um, and, and pull three things out. But my title for our talk this morning, my prayer for every single one of you in this room, my title for our talk is burn the ships. Burn the ships, burn the ships. Um, I don't know if you've heard this story before or uh, have read anything about him, but there is a man back in 1515 named uh, the Conquistador Cortez who took all of his ships, 600 men, 600 warriors, and decided he would like to venture into further lands and he wanted to take over the Aztec Empire. He wanted their gold, he wanted their ships, he wanted their, 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 their possessions. He had this idea, I'm gonna expand my territory, I'm going to expand my wealth, and I'm gonna take all of my ships, my 600 warriors, and we're going to go to the shores of the Aztec Empire and we're going to take over. So he gets all of his warriors, all of his ships, he sails across the sea, lands on the seashores, and they camp for that night, getting ready to take over the Aztec Empire. And at night, all of the men start talking to each other. There's like, there's only 600 of us. Look at this empire. Look at what we are about to do. Cortez has led us to death, essentially. We're all going to die. None of us are going to make it. This was a bad decision. We should have never followed him. And they start talking to each other amongst the camp. Let's go home. Let's get back in the ships tomorrow morning and let's go back to our land. This was a bad idea. Well, Cortez begins to hear the conversations going and he hears uh, a report back to him that, hey, people were saying we should just go home. They don't think we should be here. This was a bad idea. So that morning, C uh, Cortez gets up, he puts wood in all of the bottom of the ships and he lights them all on fire. He puts in flames every single ship they came on and he made the 600 warriors watch their ships go up in flames in front of them. They all start murmuring. They all start getting angry. They all start talking to people like, what is he doing? Why is he burning our ships? And Cortez says, I'm not burning our ships. I'm burning our escape back home. I'm not burning ships. I'm burning our retreat. And he makes the most famous statement of like his life. We are not going home. So I burned our retreat. I think for many of us, that story maybe would apply to many of us when it comes to Jesus. We say, Jesus, I will follow you. Jesus, I'm in. Until he takes us to lands that we don't know if they're gonna work and then we get on our ship and we wanna go back home. And my, my, my word for you this morning and my response to you this morning is this. For every single one of you and for us as a church and for us as Rose, burn your ships. Burn your ships. What I mean by that is burn your retreat plans. Burn your second options. Because all of us, when we come to Jesus, we're like, I'm gonna follow, I'm in, but just in case, I have my, if this doesn't go well, I have my return. I have my option out. I have my plan B. I have my return. I mean, I will follow Jesus to new lands. I will follow Jesus to new areas. I will follow Jesus to new things that he's doing in my life. But if it doesn't go according to plan, and if I don't think it's gonna work, I just wanna make sure I have my retreat. I have my plan B. I would like to submit to you that this story, what we're reading this morning, is not as harsh as you think. It's Jesus telling these two people that wanna follow him, burn your ships. Burn your retreat, burn your plan B. I wanna give you three thoughts this morning that I believe Jesus is telling these two people that wanna follow him, that I believe he's telling us as a church and you as individuals. You must understand this, church. I talked about this on Thursday night at worship and prayer. Is I think too often we want corporate expressions that we don't individually practice. What I mean by that is the amount of people that tell me, I love how Rose worships, but they don't worship. I love that Rose is generous, but they do not give. 
I love how people serve at Rose, but they do not serve. Why? Because we're okay with corporate expressions and we void individual practices. So if we're going to be this way as a church, I'm automatically saying that means you're gonna be this way as individuals. Because individuals make up churches. Services don't make up churches. Individuals make up churches. And as I've said over the last number of weeks, I don't want our church to be known about their services, but about their people about who we are as people, who we are as individuals. And so there's three things that happen in this story in Matthew, Matthew chapter eight that Jesus is saying to these two people that I believe he's saying to you and I as well. Number one is he says, I wanna make sure you know the cost of following me. The cost of following me. Look at in the beginning of this story, uh, Matthew eight, this, this scribe, a teacher, a Pharisee, a religious person, a pastor, comes to Jesus and says, I'll go wherever you want to go. I will follow you anywhere. And Jesus' response is, foxes have dens. Birds have nests. But the son of man, or I, have nowhere to even lay my head. What he's saying is, if you want to follow me, I, I want you to understand there's a cost that is connected to following me wherever I go. My, my, my fear is that for many of us maybe in the room, we want to follow Jesus as long as there's no cost. As long as I don't have to lose anything. What we really wanna do is we wanna live our life and just add Jesus to it. We wanna live how we're living, do what we do, say what we say, act how we act, but just add Jesus to our bio. Add John 3.16 to our bio, but not change how we post and how we talk. Do you see what I'm saying? We, we just want to live our life, just add Jesus to it. But friend, you must understand this morning, if you are going to be a follower of Jesus, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. Uh, I've told the story before. It's, it's one of my favorite stories. Uh, Cassie, who we'll be seeing next Sunday, who many, many of you know, her how I met Cassie was through her older brother who was a youth pastor in, in Virginia. And so I was preaching at his, his youth conference in Virginia. And he's like, hey, do you wanna go, it was, in, it was in Philadelphia. He's like, do you wanna go downtown Philly? I was like, absolutely. I wanna go buy an AI jersey, an Allen Iverson jersey. And we find this like Mitchell and Ness, like I thought like employee store. Because every hat, every shirt was like $10, $5, $20. And I find this like authentic, amazing Allen Iverson jersey. And I'm like, I'm going to buy this jersey. It's all black and red. Like it is, it's, it's thick, it's woven. It's like a very nice jersey. And I'm like, I'm gonna buy this jersey. And her brother was like, I'll buy it for you. And I was like, bro, don't worry about it. I'll buy it. He's like, I'll buy it for you. I'm like, all right, fine. Um, <laughs> just, you know, I don't have to argue with you. We get back to the hotel and I put it on. And I'm like, this is a nice jersey. I'm so, I'm texting him, but Will, thank you so much for this jersey. And then I, I have the bag, I get the receipt and it was a $300 jersey. So now I'm like, bro, I don't think he knew how much this cost. So I text him. I was like, bro, you need to come to my room right now. So Will comes to my room. He's like, bro, that's the best $30 jersey, huh? And I'm like, oh, how much do you think it was? He's like, it was $30. I looked at the price, tag. it was a $30 jersey. And I was like, oh, sir, you missed a zero. It was not a $30 jersey, it was a $300 jersey. And like his face went red and he was like, oh, I didn't see that last zero. I think for many of us, that's our relationship with Jesus. We think it's gonna cost $30 and we start following Jesus and he starts asking for things and our response is, I didn't see that last zero. I didn't realize how much this was gonna cost me. I didn't realize it was gonna cost me my Friday nights. I didn't realize it was gonna cost me relationships. I didn't realize it was gonna cost me my five-year plan. I didn't realize it was gonna cost me my relationships. I had no idea that following Jesus was actually going to cost me something. You know what's wild about the gospels is multiple times in the New Testament, Jesus tries to talk people out of following him. I'm sorry, if I'm Jesus's marketing manager, I'm like, Lord, we need as many people as we can get. We need everyone. We're trying to take over down here. We're trying to run the Roman empire. We're trying to take over the known world. We need more people. Why do you keep telling them to go away? This is not good marketing plans. But notice how many times in the gospels, Jesus tries to talk people out of following. 
The American version is the opposite. We want, we're trying to convince everyone to follow. And Jesus might be saying, you might want to let some people walk because they're not willing to pay the price. They're not willing to pay the cost of what it means to follow me. Serving will cost you. Being generous will cost you. Being loving will cost you. Being uh, outreaching to your friends and family will cost you. Following Jesus is going to cost you. But, but, this, is, but this is what disciples are supposed to do. We're supposed to already predispos- have a predisposition that it's already worth it without knowing the cost. We're supposed to say, before it ever cost me anything, Jesus was worth it. And you're like, well, you don't know how much it's going to cost you. I know the cost is unknown, but Jesus is still worth it. it. I don't know what's going to cost me. I don't know how much it's going to cost me. I don't know what it's going to take. I don't know what's going to cost it in my life, but I'm already pre-saying before the cost comes up, Jesus was worth it. And the guy is saying, I want to notice these two people. Jesus is not just walking by and saying, hey, sir, follow me. They're coming to Jesus saying, we want to follow you. Voluntarily, they're saying, we want in. And Jesus is like, I don't know if you do. Because if you follow me, it's gonna seem as if you have no place to lay your head. And then the, this, the other guy comes up to him, the disciple says, well, Jesus, Lord, I wanna follow you as well. And then he goes, just let me, just let me bury my dad. And this is where I want to pause for a bit. He says, just let me go bury my dad. And Jesus' response is so not cool. Let your dad bury himself, essentially. And then what does he say? Follow me right now. Follow me now. Let the dead bury their dead. Now, for those of you who don't know, Jewish ritual uh, burial grounds which none of us study that in college. Um, but if you, if you dive deep into Jewish burial ceremonies and, and, and how they treated the dead, uh, many scholars and many Jewish writers would believe two things about this, two different things about this context in Matthew 8. I don't care which one is true because the principle still remains the same. The first group of people believe that the, the man's father is not dead yet because there was a, a custom that the oldest son could not live his life, could not make plans until his father was dead. It was his job to take care of his dad until he died, then he could live his life. And so what some people believe what the man is saying is not my dad's dead. What he's saying is my dad's not dead yet. Let me bury him first and then I will come. The other half of scholars and writers believe that the father is dead. When you look at the Jewish death burial stuff, when your father would die, you would bury him for a year outside the city, let the body decompose. You go back a year later, take all of the bones, which is gross. You dig up the body, take all the bones, put them in, all the bones in a jar and bring the jar back to your house so that your father's blessing always remained in your house. Arguments are going back and forth between what is happening. The reality is it doesn't matter which one's happening. What Jesus is saying to the man is, I don't want your tomorrow. I want your right now. I don't care if your father is dead or is dying. The, the, The context there doesn't matter. What Jesus is saying is, young man, I don't want your tomorrow. I want your right now. I want to ask you this morning, how many of you with your journey with Jesus, you just keep giving him your tomorrow? No, one day I'm gonna. You know, once I get the kids a bit older, then we're gonna, you know, once I have more money, then I'm going to. You know, once I get my life more in order, then I'm going to. And once I graduate college, then I'm going to. And once I get my marriage back, then I'm going to. And once we pass the, then I, like how often are you treating Jesus with a one day? Tomorrow. Happens all the time in our life. Well, one day, one day I'm gonna be generous. Once I have the money. No, generosity is not a bank account thing. It's a heart thing. Well, one day, once I have X amount of money, but then once you have X amount of money, you need more money. Well, then, you know, once the kids get a bit older, we'll have more time. Then we'll be able to, 
Well, once we finish our first year of marriage, you know, the first year of marriage is really difficult. So once you get past the first year of marriage and then you realize the second year is hard and the third year is hard and the 50th year is hard. And, you know, I, I work at Nike and I, I don't know how long I'm going to be here for. I might be, I might be moving. I might not be. So I'm not going to put my roots down because I really don't know how long I'm going to be here for. But you've been moving for five years and have refused to put your roots down for five years because you might tomorrow be leaving. And how many tomorrows have you been given Jesus, but he's asking you for right now? Jesus does not want your tomorrow. He wants your today. He wants you right now. And notice what Jesus says back. No, I want, follow me now. How many of us have told Jesus, I will follow when? I will follow, but. One day, Jesus, one day. No, Jesus is not wanting your one day. He's wanting your today. He's wanting your right now. He's wanting this very moment because tomorrow then turns into today. And we just keep turning tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. Have you noticed that like, especially if like you're younger, like 2022, 20, and you keep thinking life's gonna get easier? I'm sorry, friend. Life doesn't get easier. You just get better at dealing with hard things. Life gets harder and harder and harder. And when you thought making 60 grand would be okay, now you need 70 and now you need 90 and then till my cheese kicks in and you need a hundred. <laughs> have you noticed that every mile marker you set with Jesus, you just move it? Right. Oh, come on, once I'm 22, and then you turn 22, you're like, oh, I ain't ready. Once I'm 24, how many mile markers are you gonna move until you surrender your full life to Jesus? How many, how many, well, not, no, well, not, well, maybe, well, tomorrow, and you just keep. And Jesus is not asking for your tomorrow. He's not asking for your senior year of college. He's asking for your freshman year of college. Have you noticed it's so easy to give God the peripheral, the out there, but it's so hard to give him right now, in this moment, I'll give you my Monday. Well, God, Thursday, I'm yours. No, today's Monday, I want you right now. I wanna be the church I wanna be the leader, I wanna be the pastor, I wanna be the friend that I stop telling God tomorrow. It's like, Jesus, right now is yours. Today is yours. And this moment, it is yours. I don't wanna put you off and put you off and put you off. I surrender right now. Because there's gonna be times where God calls our church or calls you and it's not the perfect time. Have you noticed it's never the perfect time? Even us taking an offering here in a few weeks, it is not the perfect time to talk about resource. Or is it? Have you noticed he's never on time? He's always five years early or two years late. Have you noticed that God is not really married to your time schedule, just you are? God moves when he moves. And I wanna be the church that whenever God walks by and says, do this, our answer is yes, I'm in. Yes, I'm in. Yes, I'm in. Yes, I'm in. I don't wanna be the guy. I don't wanna be the pastor. I don't wanna be the husband or the church leader. Like, well, God, wait, I got. No, no, God's not gonna wait. God's moving, God's active, God's progressing. God is moving and doing things. And I always wanna say, God, my answer is yes. Before I know the question, my answer is yes. Before I know the contents, my answer is yes. Before I know the cost, my answer is yes. This is where I, I wanna land. Once again, you must understand, friends, this is why you should take essentials. The Bible wasn't written randomly. Have you noticed that every story that Jesus tells is always two characters? Always. Jesus never tells parables or stories, interactions with one person. There's always multiple people. And who are the two people? Class, a scribe, and a disciple. It's almost like Jesus saying, I don't care how spiritual you are or how new you are, my call remains the same. I don't care if you just f started following me two weeks ago or you are a teaching pastor at a church, my call remains the same. Follow me today. And notice the two people, a, 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 a Pharisee, a scribe, a teacher, a religious person, and a, a disciple. These are not evil people. These aren't sinners. 
It's not a prostitute or a tax collector or an evil, immoral person. It's not an evildoer. It's not a blasphemer, all the evil people in the Bible. It's, it's a Pharisee, a teacher of the law, and a disciple. And notice the call to those two people. Follow me now. Wait. Wait, wait. He's telling a disciple, a Christian, a follower of Jesus, follow me now. I thought if you were a disciple, you were automatically following. So I'll submit to you, it's actually possible to be saved and not follow. It's actually possible to be a Christian, to be a disciple and stop following Jesus. He doesn't talk to evil people. He's not trying to get a sinner to become a saint. He's telling a disciple, follow me again. Follow me now. Because following Jesus is not just about salvation. It's about discipleship. You didn't follow Jesus the, ma- the day you made a prayer at the eighth grade summer camp. You are making another decision tomorrow. I'll follow you again today. And the next day, I'll follow you again today. Because following is not just a salvation thing. It's a discipleship thing. And many of you have convinced yourself just because you're saved, you're still following. And maybe for many of you, you stopped following some time ago. But like, well, I follow Jesus. No, you're, you follow Jesus in your salvation, but you've not followed him in your discipleship. Which is every single day waking up and saying, I follow you again. It's every morning getting up and saying, I follow you again. Knowing costs are coming. Knowing I might lose some things. Knowing my life might change. But following you is worth any cost. Following you is worth anything I might lose. And as we talk about this offering coming up and stepping out in faith and our giving and all those type of things, once again, I'm not trying to raise an offering. I'm trying to raise a spiritual principle in our church. I'm not trying to raise a certain number, though we need one to fix this building and to do a bunch of stuff for kids and discipleship, though we need a certain number. I'm not praying for a certain number because we could have a certain number raised, but not raise a certain spirit in our church. I'm not after just a number. I'm after a culture and an attitude and a spirit that would live in our church and live in the heart of every single one of you that your disposition toward Jesus is my answer is yes. Whenever you come by and say, go, my answer is yes. Whenever you come by and say, stop, my answer is yes. Whenever you come by and say, go left, my answer, Jesus, my answer is yes. Jesus is very concerned with you following him today. I think many of you need to get out of the tomorrow. Well, you know, our babies are young and they're not sleeping. And once they sleep through the night, then we'll be at church and then they start teething and then you have another kid. And then before you know it, you've been gone from church for seven years because you thought tomorrow was gonna fix it. Well, you know, we're grinding for the business and it's our first year and we're just trying to hit the black mark. We're just trying to get out of debt. And we're just trying to, you know, once the business gets going, then we'll, you know, once our marriage gets, you know, once I finish the test, you know, How many of you in the room have been married to tomorrow? God's like, I don't want your tomorrow. I want your right now. What does Jesus say in Matthew 6? Don't worry about tomorrow for it has its own issues. Follow me today. That could be to our services, that could be to your money, that could be to your relationships, that could be to your schooling, that could be to your craft, that could be to fill in the blank. How many mile markers, how many things are you gonna move, move, move until you fully surrender? Jesus, this is all yours. And right now, in this moment, today, I'm yours. Do you know why I think Jesus treated the guy that way? Because if it wasn't that, it'd be something else. The man was showing him, I'm, I'm letting you know, there's always gonna be something else I need to do. And you think, well, once I finish this, and then life happens, marriage happens, money happens, economy happens, health happens. And you just keep saying, well, one day, me and Julie say this all the time, one day we'll sleep because our kids think sleep is sinful. So they never sleep. And we're like, one, 
how many one days are you living in? One day I'll serve. One day I'll give. One day I'll invite my friend. One day, stop saying one day. God is not wanting your tomorrow. He's wanting right now. You know what's hard about the right now? Is you actually have some control on the right now. You know what's easy about the tomorrow? It's like a fake, no, I'll give you tomorrow. Jesus, tomorrow's all yours. It's giving up the control of today. What does it mean to be a big person and build into a big person? It's willing to pay the cost. And it's willing to follow him today. And I want to be known as that church. So when Jesus comes by and says, move, we're moving. I'm not married to anything, married to a building, to a name, to a process, to a system. If Jesus says move, we are moving. If Jesus says stay, we are staying. If he says jump, we are jumping. Why? Because I want to listen to his voice today. And not when he walks by, say, well, come back in a little bit. Come back in a year, come back in a season. Can you stand to your feet? I wanna pray for you this morning. We're gonna have some people get baptized this morning. I think we had four people last service get baptized. More people today get baptized. And if you're here watching a loved one get baptized, welcome, so glad you're here. But let's pray as we go into a time of worship and a time of water baptisms. Father, I pray right now for every single person. Could every person on the sound of my voice, God, whether this is the first time ever in this space and place, God, whether it's home for them and they come week in and week out, God, I don't know what the lives of every single person in this room are and what they're going through, the season of life they find themselves, the day they find themselves in. But Father, I pray right now that you would begin, continue to build bigness from the inside out from our heart to our soul, to our attitude, to our perspective, to our generosity, to our words. God, continue to build big people. God, continue to expand us and grow us and stretch us that we might become big people in you. God, I pray right now for all those. Let them follow you right now, today. Jesus, let us continually say yes to who you are, yes to what you're doing today, not tomorrow, today. In your mighty, mighty name I pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Let's go to time of worship together.